everybody. My name is Thomas Eaton. I'm currently in the ME421 Vibrations class at Binghamton University, and today I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about forging hammer vibrational damping. As you can see there, that's about what we're going to be talking about today. So a little bit about me. I'm a mechanical engineering major at Binghamton University. I'm currently in my junior year. I'm finishing it up very soon. I have an internship this summer with the General and Pharmaceuticals in the Quality Assurance Department. And I'm also a jazz trombonist, as you can see from this picture right here. So, a little bit about the steam forging hammer. It was a product of the Industrial Revolution. As people began creating more and more large steel structures, um, we needed more and more power to pound that into a shape. That's why these were created. So the first one was built in France, and it could deliver a blow up to 100 tons, which astonishes me. And something very interesting about it is that it was made to fail. So a lot of the components of this hammer were basically made so that over time they would decay and break and it would have to be replaced. So we'll talk a little bit about why that happens in a little bit. So how does this thing work? So a large metal component, or I'm sorry, just a metal component, this is the workpiece, is placed on a large anvil, usually in a die of some sort, at the bottom of the hammer. So then a large metal hammer is raised up using the power of steam and then it's released. So when it's released it creates a ton of force using a using potential energy and then when it hits the workpiece it flattens into the shape it's supposed to be and then this is basically repeated until the desired shape is reached. I'm going to watch a quick video on this showing exactly what's happening. You see the very hot metal piece right here, you see it die, it's going to be shaping it like that. Now what happens here is it sticks so the worker is going to throw some sand on it to make sure it doesn't stick. So watch how fast this process goes. Nowadays it's extremely fast. You can just hear that force being generated. And look how fast it goes. There's barely even a second in between each one. Oh, didn't mean to do that. There we go. So why would we care about this? Why does this interest us as mechanical engineers? So, as the hammer hits, it creates a huge shock, which transfers into the ground. Now, this shock can cause a large amount of damage to the workpiece, the device itself, as we talked about earlier, and even the building. That's why those parts failed early on. That's why they would keep breaking, because this, nothing was, was blocking that shock from happening. So it would just, you know, go into the ground and destroy itself over time, basically. So this can cause a, a large amount of problems, financial and safety. And overall, it could your factory could end up looking like this. Probably not really, but it gets the point across. So what can we do? So what we can do is we can fit these systems with some sort of spring mass damper. Or I'm sorry, I, I guess just a spring damper. So this damper system basically will reduce the amplitude in a short amount of time of the force of the uh, of the uh, distance being traveled by the by the anvil getting hit. So as it gets hit, it travels up and down a little bit. So over time, what a damper will do is it'll make sure that the anvil doesn't come back up as fast. It'll also reduce the amount of shock going directly into the ground with the spring system and it'll increase the life of your device by many, 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 many fold. So usually a device like this, like an elastomeric isolator, which is sort of a newer device, we'll talk about why this is a very good device in a little bit, and a more traditional device which is a viscous spring isolator. Now this is usually what we think of when we think of a spring mass damper, but I'll explain a little bit about this. So here are some examples of, of what we're looking at here. So this is, you know, obviously the steam hammer, and you can see three different setups, all pretty similar. Um, it all has a concrete base, or it's usually concrete, I guess it doesn't have to be. But here's what I was talking about earlier. So this is a layered elastomer. What you can see is that it doesn't require as much mass, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But it, this will be important later on. So it doesn't require as much mass as you can see here, so these two, you know, are on concrete. So I'll talk a little bit about how mass affects the system. So how do we even model this system? So as you saw earlier, you always have this hammer hitting and you have some sort of spring damper on the bottom here, whether it's on a concrete block or by itself, or, you know, like the elastomer system over here. So you have 
a big device like this constantly hitting down and you have a lot of these to cover up the full area of the base so that's pretty complicated but it just translates to this you know you have a smaller mass hitting a bigger mass and you can put all those springs and all those dampers into one system over here and you have your downward displacement so here's the derivation I know ugh derivation but I'll be quick so as you can see here I basically just took the image from earlier and I translated it to a piece of paper so here's some equation we need to know so the spring constant K over the mass M is equal to the natural frequency squared the damping frequency which is the damping constant over the critical damping can be shown here and the critical damping this will become important later is 2 times the square root of the mass times the spring constant so our governing equation based on Newton's theory so you have the mass times the acceleration plus the spring constant times the distance plus the damping constant times the velocity equals to zero since there's no outside force being acted upon it so you can multiply this all by m and you can get using this equation up here you can get this equation down here which will help us out and our initial condition so the displacement at time zero is going to be x zero and our velocity at time zero is going to be velocity zero so to solve a differential equation like this we need to take a guess it's not really a guess but we say it's a guess I guess it makes us feel smart so then you can plug this guy in to this equation right here take all the der derivatives and everything then you come up with this guy so this is just um, a simple algebraic equation so you can solve this with the quadratic formula and what's going to happen is you're going to get two equations you're going to get the natural frequency times the damping factor plus or minus the square root of the damping factor squared minus one so since we're dealing with linear equations we can solve for s1 and s2 using this equation so we just plug this right in here so we know these things we know our initial displacement and we know our initial velocity at time zero so we have two equations and we have two unknowns so a handy trick for this is to put it into a matrix over here where we can solve it like this and we are not looking for these we know these we're looking for these so we need to do something that also sounds scary but it isn't we just need to take the inverse of this matrix over here so what you can really do is take out the determinant of a 2 by 2 matrix which is just uh, this times this and this times this minus each other so you get the term the inverse of the determinant and then you multiply that by just a switched version so basically this is 1 over a d minus b c times a matrix d negative b negative c a so then by solving this equation you can get x1 and x2 in terms of things we already know like s2 s1 xo vo and then you can plug that back into this equation right here so there's a couple cases we can look at um, say if s1 is always negative and s2 is always positive that means zeta is always going to be greater than this value over here so that means it's over damp we'll talk about that in a little bit not too much it's not really the focus of this but as talked about earlier if c is less than 2 radical km see remember this is the critical damping factor this means that zeta is going to be less than 1 so then this guy over here is going to be imaginary which is also a scary thing for mechanical engineers but we can we can get through it so then we have these two equations right here and this i over here represents the imaginary number that we all know from uh, trig or something we learned in high school so we have this equation again it keeps popping up I know but then we can just plug in all of our values for s1 s2 into this guy right here so now we really have everything we need all we gotta do is rewrite this using a trigonomic identity and then we have this big long equation but something very good about this is we can even get rid of all the imaginary see we didn't even need to deal with it it's not that scary because they cancel out right here and then we're left with our with our damping equation right here so, a little messy I apologize but it'll get reworked in a couple seconds so to get x1 and x2 we translate that to a and b so what you can do is just simply plug in what we know x at time zero we already know it's given to us so at time zero all of this just reduces down to a so x0 equals a and then we can take the derivative the derivative of the displacement is the velocity so then we have our velocity initial which again we know and it just reduces down to this guy right here so we can find what b is and we know all this stuff all right painless wasn't too bad so now here let's talk a little bit about what happens in these systems i know i talked about under damped and over damped a little bit earlier maybe don't know what that means but 
what really happens when zeta is less than one, this means our system is under damped. That means that it will die out, but it will die out over a period of time and it will kind of oscillate still. It will travel along this path. You know, a regular spring will just, without any damping, will just continuously go on forever, technically. But everything has a little damping in it. So then if zeta is over one, which we talked about a little earlier up here, that means it'll it'll die out. It'll die out pretty slowly because it doesn't it doesn't uh, die out very quickly, as you can see here. So what we have what we're looking for in this system is critical damping. Critical damping is when zeta equals one, and this is when the system will die out and stay dead as soon as humanly possible. So how does it affect our problem? So taking all the stuff we've talked about and kind of putting into a math problem, a nice little physics problem right here. We have our RAM, which is little m, which is about uh, 1,361 kilograms. And just for the sake of this problem, the anvil is 10 times that much. We can talk about uh, what effect the anvil mass has a little later, but for right now, we'll just say it's 10 times. This is kind of the standard. So the RAM stroke. So this is the height in which the RAM goes and then is dropped down. That's what kind of creates our potential energy. It's 1.25 meters. And coefficient of restitution between the RAM and the workpiece of the die, you know, I got this from a physics book, is about 0.2. It, it goes between 0.2 and 0.5, but we can just choose 0.2 for right now. And so what I talked about earlier is we have two sort of systems we, we can look at. We can look at the elastomeric damping system, and we can look at the, the traditional spring damper system. Now, the big difference between these guys, besides cost, is the natural frequency. So the natural frequency of the elastomeric system is a little bit higher. So this is in hertz. And uh, you can convert this into um, radians per second by just multiplying by 2 pi. And yeah, so you can see here this one's a little higher and this one's a little lower. So we'll talk about what that does to the system a little later. And the acceptable amplitude of usually, this is a standard in the industry of uh, the anvil I'm getting hit is about 7 millimeters with this sort of system right here. And so really what we're just trying to find for the purposes of this um, project is we're just looking at the different effects that K and C has on the system. So K and C are both related in the, in the damping factor. So we'll just look at those. We'll look at the different damping coefficients, or I'm sorry, damping ratios, and we'll just see what effect that has on the system. So once again, a little math right here. It's a little small, but I'll, I'll talk through it. So we have our... Um, Conservation of energy up here, mgh equals one half mv squared. So basically, um, the height of this guy, this guy's going to translate a bunch of energy into this guy down here, and so we can find the velocity of the smaller mass right before it hits the workpiece on the anvil down here. So we can just multiply the mass times the gravity times the height, which is the ram stroke we talked about earlier, and that's equal to one half mass times the velocity at the bottom here, assuming that all the uh, energy goes into that. So from that we can find it's about 5 meters per second using these parameters that we set for ourselves. And we have our coefficient of restitution, it's 0.2 right here. So we can find, we can relate uh, V1 final to V2 final using this coefficient of restitution equation we learned from physics 1 or statics or dynamics I guess. So we can find that due to the, the fact that it's 5 meters per second and the coefficient of restitution is 0.2, uh, V1 final equals v2 final plus one. So then we can plug that into another conservation of energy equation down here. You know, after a little bit of algebra, we can find the velocity of this large mass down here because it's hitting here and it's transferring energy into this large anvil mass down here. And that's what's causing the oscillation is that initial impact, that initial shock. So this is pretty small. I mean, it's such a heavy, uh, such a heavy thing that even a small velocity like this is, is huge. So it's going 0 0.364 meters per second downward. And so now we have everything we need for our vibration equation that we derived up here. This is a little, a little bit nicer than earlier, so hopefully you can read it now. Um, you now you have your exponential up here. So the negative, this is where what we get from our elastomer, elastomeric, our spring damper. This, this uh, damping ratio is something we can choose, um, which is what we're going to basically do we have we can find a from this equation which in this case is just going to be zero because we're, we're not assuming the anvil over here is at any other point besides where it is right now 
And then B, using this equation, since we don't have an XO, it's just the initial velocity over the damp natural frequency. I don't think I talked about the damp natural frequency, but basically that's just the regular natural frequency times the um, radical 1 over the damping ratio squared. And the damping ratio is zeta. So we now can find our initial parameters here. And here is just a restatement of the equation. So when we plug all this in to a MATLAB code, uh, if you'd like, you can pause the video here and take a peek at the code. It's nothing too crazy. It's just uh, showing two different plots. So let's talk about what happens when you choose different spring constants. So up here, we're talking about the, the spring constant K and the damping coefficient C of the spring mass damper. You can see, I won't go all the way up, but um, here we are. So zeta is, you know, based on both of those. So changing zeta will change both of these. And we can figure out the effect that it has on it using this MATLAB code right here. So I know earlier I talked about, um, I talked about critically damped systems. So we can see here, so this is in a, the ideal condition. You know, everyone wants critical damping because it's very nice. You just go down and then back up in one straight shot. Um, you can see here the displacement uh, is less than seven millimeters, you know, that's kind of what we want. And it goes down to the initial impact and right back up. So you can see here that if you're re we're using the spring system, which has a uh, little bit less natural frequency, that it'll go down a lot more. So the amplitude is going to be a lot higher based on this frequency right here. And then the elastomeric goes down a lot less. So that's kind of where that difference comes in. That's why it's important. So, you know, if the critical damping was set to 1, there just wouldn't be any, any curve. So I just set it to 0.99 to kind of show the effect that it has. So that's critical damping. So that's the ideal condition. But, you know, that ideal condition is not always within reach. So if we go down to z equals 0.5, then we start to see something a little bit more spring mass dampy, you know. So you can see right here. Oh, and you can also tell up here it dies out very quickly. Um, 0.6 seconds is barely anything. And remember in the video it keeps clamping down about once a second. So that we'll take that as our benchmark. We want it to be dead by one. You know, sounds kind of morbid, but that's what we want. So in this system, you know, you can see it goes down, and then it goes back up, and then up. It's a, kind of like a roller coaster. But it's, it's, what's happening is it's dying. Each time you can see the amplitude is going down a little bit, down a little bit, down a little bit, and eventually it dies. So this frequency not only has an effect on the amplitude like here, but it also has an effect on how quickly it dies out. So, you know, you have less of a natural frequency, it dies out a little longer. You have more of a natural frequency, it dies out a little less. This is called light damping. It's about 0.5 uh, zeta. And we're going to go down even more to 0.1. So this is our, our, our ratio is 0.1. So this is, we, they, we, this is not what we want at all. In fact, it's a little strange even. And it goes down, very small, but then back up large and it gets even larger. So it's going down and then it kind of ex accelerates itself back up and down like this. So this is this is not very good. Although it is below the seven millimeter range, it's not really what we're looking for because it does take a while to die out. Remember that video earlier? Um, it takes a while, or it's very quick. You know, you only have about one second in between. So this this is not what we're looking for right here. So what information does this really give us? You know, we talked about these three systems, but you know, what does this all mean? So this is very important when we're trying to decide what kind of damping system we want. Um, and you know, you could say, oh, I want this to be critically damped, but that's very hard, especially when you're working with, you know, pre-made items, uh, like these guys. So what you can really do is you can just choose, um, you know, you can find out what works using this. You can figure out K and you can figure out C by relating what you want to happen here. You know, say you like 0.5 and from 0.5, you can figure out, um, by trial and error, what K you want and what C you want. And then you can just design a system or you can take an already made system and figure out what works for the for the device at hand. So in conclusion, today we talked about um, the damping of the vibration caused by an industrial steam hammer. So the derivation for critical for damping was shown a little bit earlier. And then we analyzed the system with physics to determine our initial conditions. 
and the system responds with a plot in MATLAB with different variables, and the effect that the different variables have is on the frequency, like the frequency, the, the effect of the different variables, like frequency and the damping ratio has on the system, remember uh, 0.99 critical damping, 0.5 is under damped, and this is very under damped. So thank you all for tuning in. I hope this was informational, and thank you all for watching. And here are some references down here. All right. Thank you.